चक्रवर्ती सच्चिदानंद श्री दशरथ राम सीता राम गोदंड राम मारुदि राम सुंदर राम आत्मा राम पट्टा भी राम श्री साई राम introduce the chief guest for tonight, uh, Brother Richard Lumner has a very impressive C, a CV, but I'll keep it very short. Uh, Brother Richard was, uh, it has become a very familiar face amongst the Sai uh, devotees, both here in Sydney and in Prashanti. He was born in Johannesburg, South Africa, and after graduating from high school, completed his compulsory military training uh, in South Africa before moving to the United States for university studies. He earned his BSc from the University of California, Irvine, in 1990, and followed this up with an MBA from uh, Macquarie Graduate School in New South Wales in 1966. Uh, Richie, if you don't mind me calling you that, uh, Rich has played professional tennis on the ATP World Tour and retired from professional tennis in 1996. He has set up and managed many small and large business enterprises uh, in the United States, in uh, South Africa, and also here in Australia. On behalf of uh, the late Mr. Nan Nelson Mandela, Richie developed an online fundraising initiative for Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. Since 1996, Richie has been the executive chairman for Africa Tikkun Australia, a fundraising organization for impoverished townships in South Africa. He continues to raise his fund for children in Prashanti, and I believe he's introduced Tai Chi to the students at the ashram. Uh, Richie was raised in the Jewish tradition and came to Swam in August 2012. He's a member of the Hobush Center and has visited Prashanti three times since 2012. Over the last 20 years, Richie has studied and practiced Tai Chi, Taoism, Buddhism, New Age spirituality, among many of his other pursuits. Uh, currently, Richie is a holistic life coach, working with executives, athletes and householders in Sydney. The theme for today's talk is Every Day is a Birthday with Swami. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, welcome Brother Richie. Oh my Lord, take my love, let it flow in the fullness of devotion to Thee. Oh my Lord, take these hands so that they may work incessantly for Thee. Oh my Lord, take my soul, let it be merged as one with Thee. O oh my Lord, take my mind and thoughts, let them be in tune with thee. O oh my Lord, take my everything, so I may be an instrument to work for thee. Thy will be done. Om Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Bhavyana Maha. Respected elders, aunties and uncles, brothers and sisters, friends, possibly enemies, I hope not. <laughs> What a tremendous honor to be invited to speak before you, to share with you on this most incredible, auspicious day, this birthday. And I'm going to talk about the principle of birthday. As I was um, heading over this morning, I thought I'd actually look up the word um, and I'd check in with my trusted friend who almost knows as much as Swami, uh, my friend called Mr. Google, and to find out what does Advent mean? And I found out to um, my discovery that it means coming. Adventus means coming. And it refers to, in, I believe in the Christian religion, the coming of the Messiah. And I'd like to share a little bit with you today um, my personal experience because it was this coming of the Messiah into my heart that has completely shaped my life and what I call my real birthday which took place on the 4th of August at 3 o'clock in the morning in 2012. It's nice to be able to actually name it. Um, this birthday was not just the birth of the form, this beautiful form of beloved Bhagawan. It was the birth 
for the understanding of Satya Dharma, Shanti, Prema, and Ahimsa. The birth of this beautiful teachings that entered into my life came about by not coincidence, but by coincidence, as we've come to know and, and love to make the mention. A little bit of background. Um, Brother Anil gave some history around my upbringing. I was brought up in Johannesburg um, in what was an incredibly privileged environment. Um, a loving family. Um, I went through some tremendous, beautiful times growing up um, in South Africa. And then went to the United States and pursued a tennis career. And after my tennis career, um, which was quite successful, enough to give me the opportunities to play at Wimbledon and the US Open and, and mix with a who's who. I never became a who's who, but I mixed with the who's who. But um, I continued a life, um, and I, I like to call it a life of pleasure seeking, um, right up until the age of 40, 45, two years ago. I was a real pleasure seeker. I was looking for that fulfillment in the external world. And at times, by His grace, I, I got it, and I was successful, and as well as by His grace, there were times where I was very unsuccessful, and I had to learn that experience as well. But I was very driven, I was very intense around finding fulfillment in what we call the external. This led to a roller coaster of experiences in business and in relationships, uh, married and divorced. I've got two beautiful children that I'm very grateful for who are my also great masters. And um, what came with this roller coaster um, and a couple of scenarios that happened in my life, some were quite traumatic, some deaths in the family and different experiences, was the beginning of severe anxiety and depression. And it started with a series of minor anxiety attacks which kind of elevated themselves into what's called and labeled panic attacks which are quite extraordinary because you feel like you're going a bit crazy, there is nowhere to run, there is nowhere to hide, and you look for everything in every possible avenue and channel, sometimes even in exercise. Fortunately, I never turned to um, what they call sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I stayed within the path of fitness is what, what I knew. Um, I was very much into my Tai Chi. I had a beautiful, wonderful master whose teachings were synonymous with, with such a Sai Baba. And um, yet I was still experiencing these attacks and these experiences of depression and anxiety. And as the years got on, they became more severe and closer and closer and closer together. And I need to share this with you because it's a really important point. Is It was incredibly frustrating because there were many times I took stock while this was going on and I said to myself, you know, I have a physical body that's in good health. I'm lucky. I'm blessed. I have a family that is wonderful. I have no issues with my family. I have finances. I'm, I'm materially, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing pretty well. I was married at the time. I had a very nice wife, very kind, and two beautiful children. And you know, I could not understand how is it possible, with all of these things being so wonderfully met, how is it possible that I could still be experiencing this tremendous amount of fear and anxiety and worry that would just overtake me, override me. And in, felt, in, in fact, I must tell you, I felt a little bit guilty because how could I do this when there was so much poverty and so much impoverished uh, um, societies and communities out there? And I was privileged, but yet I was feeling so incredibly, incredibly empty. Well, what, what started to happen in the year of 2012 was these panic attacks started to get more and more severe and closer and closer and closer together until in um, uh, late September, early August, after four or five days, day after day of experiencing more, almost 24 hours of this, these, these experiences, um, I reached a point, I woke up one morning at three o'clock in the morning and um, not to disturb my wife, I moved over into another room and there was nobody else I could call. It was three o'clock in the morning and I, 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 uh, I couldn't reach anybody. So I decided what I was going to do is I'm going to reach for Lifeline. Picked up the phone to call Lifeline because I had started to entertain suicidal thoughts. And even that started entering my head, well, that isn't even really an option because you've got children and that would be too selfish and I need to actually just continue as I am even in this state. So that was taken away from me. 
Um, I had tried medication for a few weeks and it just didn't agree with my body. Um, it just made me numb and unfeeling. So there was another tick. Well, I've tried that. Uh, I've tried all the spiritual understanding that I could, I could think of. Tried over-exercising. That didn't work. And um, I called Lifeline. Interestingly enough, I got put on to hold at 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, subsequently, I phoned and I found out there is no such thing as being put on hold with Lifeline. You can't be put on hold. <laughs> so we know who was putting me on hold. And I wasn't on hold for one minute or two minutes. I was on hold for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes at 3 o'clock in the morning, calling a suicide line, I thought, well, I can't hold on anymore. So I put the phone down. And the only thing that came to me at that moment, and I don't know where it came from, was I got into my hands and my knees. I put these hands together. And brothers and sisters, I'm not used to doing this, but I put these hands together. And when I put my hands together, the prayer that I had in my head was, please God, whoever you are, wherever you are, I just need your help so badly. I don't know where else to turn to. I've tried everything. I don't know what to do. Please help me. It was from the pit of my stomach, you can understand. And out of nowhere, this beautiful, incredible, unexplainable image, sensation, Baba, I've come to learn, of Sai Baba entered my room, this little room that I was, that I was in. It was undeniable Sai Baba. I was very surprised, I have to tell you, because the last... The only real experience I had of Sai Baba was when I was eight years old. My sister, who was a Sai Baba devotee at the time, had taken me to a satsang. So we're talking almost uh, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and I used to like going to the satsang with her because I used to like the comics and the food. Um, so it didn't have that much of an impact, but obviously he had entered my head and entered my heart to some degree. But he kept me on hold for 30, 40 odd years. And the incredible thing was, I fell asleep immediately. I hadn't slept for five days. I'd been in sheer anxiety and panic for five days straight. So I hadn't really slept, not that I could remember. I instantly fell asleep. And the next morning what happened was I woke up and I called a friend of mine who I, I knew had been following Swami only recently in the last four or five years. And um, I said, I really need to speak to you. First, he was a good friend, and I, I wanted to share with him actually how much I was going through because I, I kept it hidden quite well. I was a bit, a bit shy about my anxiety and, and these series of panic attacks. My ego didn't like this at all. And uh, he came over, and he came over with three gifts, as I call them, three incredible gifts. One is he brought Vibhuti with him, this strange, incredible healing ash. Two... He brought with him the Gayatri Mantra. And three, he brought a book called uh, Love and Suffering. And um, he proceeded just to give me a little bit more background and a little bit of insight around Sai Baba and maybe some of the things that I could explore, including the Vibhuti and, and the Gayatri and reading this book, which I did. I took up immediately. And uh, for the next 24 hours, I just took hold of the Gayatri. I started chanting it as much as I could. I started reading this book. And I, I, I kept putting Vibhuti on my tongue and on my forehead. And um, 48 hours later, it was the 4th of August, I remember I was walking, sorry, the 6th of August, so the 4th was the night, two nights before. The 6th of August, I was walking with the dog. Um, it was an August evening, fairly, fairly cool, and um, nobody else around. And I was still chanting the Gayatri. I really just loved this mantra. It just took hold of me. And I'd never learned a mantra in my life other than the Jewish prayer of, here is Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And um, I remember walking and while chanting the, the, the Gayatri, thinking to myself, hang on, this is a really strange feeling. And the feeling was the feeling of being normal. I just felt normal. I didn't feel anxiety. I didn't feel like I needed to run. There weren't these crazy sensations going on. I just felt completely normal. And it was the most beautiful feeling just to feel okay. And um, as I thought to myself, wow, there's a cloud has disappeared, I feel okay. I had this incredible smell, this incredible fragrance that I had never ever smelled before in my life. And it was the smell of jasmine. So we all know what that's, <laughs> we've heard or smelt it or we know what I'm talking about. And it was a very unusual smell, it was very, it was, it was, it was very noticeable. And I looked around 
to see if I could find where the smell was coming from. Because of course the mind goes straight into, I need an answer and it needs to look like this. And um, there was no jasmine bush, it was August. Um, there was nobody walking around. I even smelled my jacket to think maybe it was my wife had put on a new perfume. You know, the, the mind has to doubt. Somewhere in the cavities in the back of the mind, there was something that said, that's the smell of Sai Baba. And I realized it. And the smell had disappeared and I, I tested it. I said, Swami, at that time, Sai Baba, if that is you, this is the second time in 48 hours you've presented yourself, I'm going to walk 10 steps. And after 10 steps, if it's you, I want to smell this again. I walked 10 steps. This time the smell was as if he had throw, thrown the vibhuti or the jasmine in my face. It was so powerful that it almost knocked me off my, my feet. But the feeling this time wasn't normal. The feeling was pure ecstasy. I felt this movement up the back of my spine. I felt my whole body want to expand and take off like a rocket ship. I'd never in my life ever experienced anything quite like it. And believe me, after 45 years as a major pleasure seeker, I had experienced lots of pleasure. But this was so far and beyond anything I could have ever dreamed of. Immediately into my head, the thought came, I must call my friend Robbie to tell him what's going on. I needed to share immediately. As I finished the sentence of Robbie, his, my phone rang, it was in my pocket. And of course, who was it? It was Robbie. And I proceeded to tell him, I said, Robbie, you're not going to believe what's going on right now. And he laughed, you know, he had obviously knew the stories and, and so forth. And from that day onwards, Swami turned my life around 180 degrees, or call it 360, I prefer the 180, because I don't want to go back to where I came from. <laughs> And the dream started to come. I started to swallow and engulf Swami literature and his teachings. And he just shifted and shaped everything. And not since the 4th of August have I ever experienced a moment of anxiety or a sleepless night, thanks to his grace. And my wish and my hope and my, my prayer, and again, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share the story with you. But I believe as an empty vessel, which I work hard at being, trying to get that pleasure-seeking ego out of the way so that Swami can breathe through me, think through me, live through me, love through me, is to share with those who are already on the path and who love Him so dearly, to reinforce that love, to those who sometimes wane from the path, to come back to the path and come back to Swami, for those who might be despondent because he's no longer in the form. I hope that my story helps to reinforce your, your love and your devotion and your belief and your faith in this incredible, incredible avatar. And what else to say other than the greatest miracle that has ever entered this life, the birthday for me, was the miracle of Sai Baba and the miracle of his teachings of such a dharma, shanti, prema, nahimsa, and to love all and serve all, and to help ever and to hurt never. As I've said before, follow these principles. It's all about love. It's all about love. You do this, you can't go wrong. Jay Sairam. Thank you, uh, Brother Richard, for sharing such an important part of your life uh, so bravely with us. It's always easy to share uh, things that are great and wonderful, the trophies that you win and all the other things. But uh, what you shared with us today is very personal, and we're so glad that you're able to do it so sincerely and so beautifully. Uh, there's a whole lot of adjectives I could use for Richie, but uh, as the Aussies might say, he's a top bloke. And currently he's, uh, he's helping people everywhere. Uh, Thursdays he teaches Tai Chi for a whole lot of uh, people uh, at, in Wentworthville. If you're interested, Wentworthville Primary School on Thursday nights, and we have a wonderful uh, time with him. Thanks, uh, Richie.